tell, I've never done one of these Zoom style presentations. People are people are actually online right now. Nice. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you to all of the attendees. Good morning, good evening, and and good night. Uh, I know that we have attendees from across the globe. I'm really excited to to be speaking here today at uh, the Inclusive Research for Inclusive World, really talking about the history and the future of, of Busara's research agenda. Um, by way of introductions, my name is Channing Jang. I'm the CEO of Busara. Um, and by way of introducing Busara, Busara is, uh, hopefully you'll know, uh, having come to this event, but if you haven't, Busara is a nonprofit uh, whose mission is to work with researchers and organizations to advance and apply behavioral science in pursuit of poverty alleviation. Uh, today we have a very informal agenda, which should also be quite illuminating and fun. Get, uh, get a chance to catch up with 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 the different people and, and share our our vision going forward. Uh, first of all, I'm going to have a conversation with our founder and scientific director Johannes Haushofer, um, and I will let him introduce himself in a second. Um, after that, we'll turn it over to Anisha, who is our research and innovation director at Busara, and Jennifer who is uh, one of our lab managers who's, who's worked with Busara, um, even predates mine and one of the one of very first, in fact, the very first uh, employee at Busara. Um, so before we get we get to the, the conversation with, with Anisha and Jennifer, Johannes and I are gonna have a little catch up and sit down uh, talking about the history of Busara, which is always kind of a fun trip down memory lane. Before we do that, maybe Johannes, you could, you could briefly introduce yourself. Great. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Johannes Hausofer. I started Busara back in, I think, 2012 um, as originally just a lab where we could do behavioral science experiments in Nairobi. And since then, it's grown in a various in various directions that we can talk about. And I'm now uh, I moved recently to the University of Stockholm uh, and I'm appointed in the economics department there, but still continue to do a lot of work with and through Busara. Great. Thanks, Johannes. Um... And so, yeah, let's let's get into it. I mean, I remember when I when I saw Busara and Johannes, if you haven't seen this, Johannes has recently shared on Twitter some of the original logo designs for for Busara, which was which was delightful. It was amazing that there was actually a website before there was you know, even a lab. Johannes, tell me a little bit about how how and why you you put it up there so quickly. You, you like the website was there that almost even predated the lab. What, what led you to right. want to advertise oh. that? No, no, no. I think I just like at some point once we had the lab, I decided we needed to have like an identity. And so I hired someone to do logos. I don't think the website was there before we had the lab. Okay. Uh, the lab was definitely <laughs> the first thing that happened. And the, the lab happened because uh, you probably remember this or maybe Chani, you weren't there yet. We mm -hmm. I was working with IPA a lot at the time, Innovations for Poverty Action in Kenya, uh, who are this NGO that runs a lot of randomized control trials, mostly for economists. And I was running my own work through them and they were hiring, they were renting a new office in Nairobi and they had an extra suite in it. So they were like using three or four suites and they had a separate one that they wanted to, uh, that they didn't have use for. And so they looked for someone to rent that. And I had just gotten some grant money from the NIH. And so Colin Christensen, who was the IPA country director at the time, I met him for coffee in, uh, in Harvard Square when he was visiting the US and he said, ah, we have this extra suite of offices. We don't know what to do with it. And so I mentioned to him, oh, you know, I always thought it would be fun to set up a lab. Don't you guys want to set up a lab? And he said, well, no, but we'll support you <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do it. And so that was the, the very first start. I see. And, yeah. and I remember kind of early on when I joined, I joined in about, by way of reference, I joined technically like January 6th on 2013. So the lab had kind of been established. Uh, I know that uh, Jennifer, Monica, Irene were all there, um, but it was it was very new to me. Tell me, Johannes, about the, those early days. I missed the very first part of the recruitment. I missed the first kind of uh, market equilibrium experiment that you ran with oh, Naomi. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about what that was like kind of doing something in very new for the very first time in a new context. Yeah, that was very fun. So in the first year, we basically, so we, we then rented this office suite and I just bought 24 computers that I, like from some sort of shady dealer who got them from <laughs> Dubai somehow. Um, and they were like cheap touch screens. And, uh, and then we, 
went to Kibera and recruited participants and invited them to the lab. And I think we ran the first session like in April or so of 2012, if I remember correctly. And we had like, I was so proud of the touch screens that I removed all of the keyboards from the computer, <laughs> which, which came back to bite me because then of, of course everything crashed like three or four times during the session, partly because the power went out, partly because Ztree crashed the software that we used. There was a whole bunch of stuff that went wrong and it took super long. People were very patient, but got impatient eventually. Um, so that was very hectic. And um, yeah, exactly. That very first experiment was using the old, like uh, sort of economic markets in the lab kind of double auction experiments um, mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, that were some of the first experiments that had ever been done in experimental economics in a, in a lab. And so mm -hmm. I thought that was like a nice way of, uh, of christening the lab by running these very classic paradigms. Mm -hmm. um, and that's still sitting around somewhere as a working paper. And it turns out like these markets worked just as well as they did <laughs> everywhere else. So that was really nice to see. Um, and then very quickly, like in the summer of that year, summer of 2012, there was a large project run by a group that was partly from Berkeley, partly from Norway. So Ted Miguel, Bertil Tungaden, um, Simon Berge, uh, Simon Galle, um, Lars Eva Berge, Kelly Zhang, and so on. They ran this study on co-ethnic preferences. So that was the first time we ran a co-ethnic preferences study. It was one of the first experiments. And that has become one of the important paradigms that we use now, right? Like many lab mm -hmm. studies have sort of co-ethnic preferences yep. built into them. Um, and so that was a huge lift because they wanted like 600 participants, which was at the time for a lab study very large. Mm -hmm. I mean, now they do that all the time, but at the time lab studies were like, I don't know, 50, 100, 200 people and they wanted 600. And so we sort of, that that was hard but we managed to do it and i think that was uh, we, you know with sort of lots of failures along the way and they were super patient with us we got a lot of things wrong and i remember being on the phone with ted miguel apologizing of, about how badly everything was going uh but yeah in the end it worked and i think that paper came out like a year or two ago mm -hmm. in jea i think that was the uh, yeah that was super nice to see that first paper come to fruition yeah, and some of these things have long tails, right? Like, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that paper was crucially important for making the lab sustainable, partly because mm -hmm. then many pe people found out about it, but also mm -hmm. partly because that little bit of like revenue allowed mm -hmm. us to actually fund the lab for, you know, I mean, I had used my grant money, but that was running out very quickly at the rate that this rent was eating into <laughs> it and these computers and, you know, paying the participants so i gave it i think the runway that i had given it was like much less than a year like eight months mm -hmm. or something and mm -hmm. so it really sort of hung in the balance and that project is what rescued it and what allowed it to continue existing yeah i, I do remember when i had a initial conversation with you to to head to kenya and i'll, I'll tell my origin story a little later you were like, yeah, yeah, let's go run some stuff. It'll, let's run some stuff while it's still around because <laughs> it might yeah. close, you know, the, the runway is, is short. Um, yeah. And I also remember, yeah, one of the single biggest expenses in the first few years was actually the cubicles. Those things were very expensive because they had to be right. manufactured, sent over from Mombasa or something. Uh, so so it, was, it was quite a feat to stuff I that had, they were in that small not, room. Not Mombasa, Mombasa, but Mombasa Road, where all the friends Mombasa Road, that's right. right? Yeah. And so the story of those is I was based in Zurich not quite anymore I think I was already at MIT but I was in Zurich until just before then and Ernst Fair has this massive lab in Zurich that is like very uh, advanced and they have these um, convertible cubicles so you can they are cubicles mm. but you can turn them into just a regular classroom if you want to run group experiments or you can turn some cubicles into small group sessions settings, but then leave the rest of the walls in and so on. And so I, I basically went, went into that lab and measured everything. It's like, you know, like stealing their design essentially. And so <laughs> uh, 
made the drawings that this company on Mombasa Road made the cubicles from in a way that allow you to like disassemble them without actually using any any screwdrivers. There was a whole like a whole story of how we made those cubicles. A little lab espionage, I see, Jonas. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely a lot of espionage involved. It was all above board because Ernst knew about it, but it, was still, it felt very clandestine. Fantastic. So, you know, while Johannes is doing all of this on, on one side, we have Jennifer, who I, I want to turn to, um, uh, who is really kind of, you know, employee number one at Busara. Jennifer, first of all, tell me about your experience getting hired. That must have been a wild experience. I mean, the lab, lab experiments didn't really exist in Kenya at the time. What was that like for you? Yeah, thank you so much, Chani. I think my experience, and I think I've told this story before, I think it was one of a kind. I remember uh, going for the interview and receiving a call from the, by then, lab manager, labs, I can say like the CEO or the manager at the time was supposed to interview me. And he was, she was like, why don't you like not alight at Jonathan Court? Why don't you come all the way to Prestige? Then we can walk down this together. <laughs> And remember, I know when you're planning to go for the interview, you know, you are all dressed up, you want to yep. look nice, the high heel shoes and all that. So imagine alighting at Prestige Plaza and having to walk down to do that and go in high heels. And I remember, <laughs> like, she was, I think Giovanna, she was very fit at that particular point, walking very fast, asking me questions. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> that was like the toughest interview. And I remember walking into the lab, yeah, I think. There was even no one at the office. I'm sure that's why the reason she asked me <laughs> to yeah, yeah. alight and press so we can walk down because there's even no one to receive me at the office. She was like, even the one practically opening the doors and all that. It mm -hmm. just shows how much. And I think at that particular point, normally we used to go to the office only when there's work to be done. Yeah. So mm. I remember there's a, there's a day I was even I was going to work when I was just in town, boarding a matter to go. I so, no, you don't have to come in today. You have nothing flat for today. Could you please come tomorrow? <laughs> Yeah, so basically those were the first few days at Busara. I think uh, I joined, I worked a few days in 2012. And at that particular time, it was with, I think, uh, uh, the study on stress and economic decision making was, the preparations were underway. So, you know, the way you want to start running a lab study and things that just don't work at the time you want them to. So they keep on pushing and all that. Yeah, so that was my early day experience at Busara. Yeah, and, and early on, you like everyone I know was kind of a jack of all trades. You had to do everything. I was programming Z-Tree, debugging computers, plugging things in and out. And I'm sure, Jennifer, you were running sessions, dealing with PIs, even recruiting. What was? Tell me about recruitment. How did the participants uh, respond to the lab setting? That must have also been a foreign experience for them. Yeah, so I think I was first introduced to recruitment, you know, having to, I think to me, it was more like, uh, I can say it was a tasking <laughs> exercise because the consenting bit of it, trying to explain what is it that you do. Because even to me, behavioral science was such a very new concept to me. So I have to go out and explain to what is it you are doing? What is it you want me to come and do? And yeah, and what do I stand to gain from all this? Yeah, so to me, going out and re recruiting people at that particular time was uh, a bit, I think, the most challenging. But also the effort that was used at that we used at that particular time was just having people who are well known to the community. So mm -hmm. like help us with the mobilization and all that. Yeah. So, but in the initial phases, and I remember Johannes having talked about. Um, the ethnic preferences study and how the sample was so huge. So I remember even visiting some of our subject pool areas, trying to recruit, especially like if you're targeting specific people. And also I remember there was a time when they said, I think I, I was part of the ethnic preferences during the second phase. So during that time also it was around the run up to the 2013 election. So, mm -hmm. you know, also people are a bit, you know, uh, adamant being recruited, actually, if you're asking questions about their tribe also, that was yep. also something that you really had to be cautious about. But I think uh, people just being open, receptive and all that. And I remember even sometimes when participants would show up to the lab and uh, a session would be full and then, you know, like, you know, you can't admit more than the number of computers you have in the lab. Some of them like, I really want to have this experience. Like money is not a motivation to make. Oh, Would you like yeah. to give me a chance to participate? I think those are some of the things that were so encouraging at that particular time, yeah. 
Yeah, and I think we'll see this later. I'm, I'm sure Anisha will touch on this. This is why this is part of our research agenda going forward is overwhelmingly we've seen, you know, despite the fact that we often do research and recruit from very low income areas, that's not the main motivating factor for people. They, they really see the research as a way to help their community. They really want to know the results of that research and they want to, want to be included in, in that research process. So I think that's a really good point, Jennifer, that even from the early days, that natural curiosity really drove people uh, to the lab. Um, I want to turn a little bit more on, on sustainability, Johannes. Um, I always thought it was fascinating, you know, having worked at a lab in, during my PhD and having seen many different kinds of labs, um, you know, in, in my research career, this was really one of the very few, maybe the only lab, certainly at the time, that made it a point to engage outside researchers, right? Not just outside of your particular research group, to your campus, like maybe Berkeley X Lab, but really outside to, to anyone. And, and I remember you saying the lab should always be a public good. Now that, that ended up working out really well, but that's often a very risky move because you have to give up your precious lab time, your staff, your lab space to other people. Tell me more about that decision and, and how you made it. And then how did you balance your own growing research agenda with, with what other people wanted to do at the lab? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't even know if I have a good answer to that because that was sort mm -hmm. of always part of the idea for me that this should be for everybody to use. Um, so I didn't really ever envision it as just like something that I would use. It was always supposed to be for others as well. And really basically just because I thought it was such a glaring gap that there wasn't a mm. lot of behavioral science, like lab-based behavioral science being done in Kenya and other settings that are similar. Um, so it was really mainly in the service of plugging that giant hole or starting to plug it. Um, and then in terms of balancing it with my own time. So I think, the, I mean, you know this better than anybody. I think the main way that I tried to balance it but was by just trying to grow it as much as possible by adding lab capacity, right? Like you, you remember how we try to squeeze like, you know, another little computer in the corner somewhere so that <laughs> you have one more. Um, like the idea of running like collecting data very quickly was always super attractive to me because that I think has often held the lab stuff up. Um, mm -hmm. And that's only speaking about fixed labs. Like we can, you know, we can get into like digital data collection, mobile data collection, but in the fixed lab, I always was interested in having very large capacity. And so the fact that we now have three, I'm super excited about, and that I think has removed a lot of the bottlenecks. Like I've never mm -hmm. had, the, had the feeling that I had to wait for others uh, to run my own study at Busara. Like there was always capacity at pretty short notice, I had the impression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and when I joined, we were really focused on uh, this, you know, this idea about stress and economic decision-making. Tell me a little bit about, about that line of work that you did, because that was a big part of what Busara's past history was in, in terms yeah. of, of lab work. Yeah, that was part of the first two grants that funded Bosara. So I had this one NIH grant that I got in 2010 when I was still a PhD student in Zurich that proposed to test some basic hypotheses about stress and decision-making uh, or even just poverty and decision-making actually. I think stress was already part of it. And um, that's what originally funded Bosara. And that actually hadn't been written with Bosara in mind. I had said, I mm. wanna do experiments in Switzerland, but then I talked to the NIH and they thought, experiments in Kenya would also be nice. And so that's what led to me being able to spend that grant money on creating Busara. And then the follow-up grant to that was also an NIH grant that proposed to do a deeper dive on stress and economic choice. And we're still digesting that data to some extent. I mean, there's one small paper published on it, but uh, other than that, we're still, we're still working on that. That was a pretty big data collection effort where we had I think three or four different stress paradigms, mm -hmm. the tree or social stress test, uh, even hydrocortisone administration. I think we were probably one of the first studies that did that in a setting like this, uh, giving people hydrocortisone pills to measure their decision-making afterwards. Um, so yeah, that was always part of the mission in the sense that a lot of the money that funded it came from that kind of, uh, from those grants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so Jennifer, you know, 
when you think about behavioral science, a lot of people often don't think about more nuanced factors like, like stress, although we see this play out time and time again in the communities that we serve, how important that of a paradigm that is to their well-being. What was it like going and stressing people out in our lab? What, what, to tell me about administering these studies from, from your point of view. What, how was that experience? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think also just being new to behavioral science at that particular point and having to administer some of the stressors. Yeah, so I know luckily maybe for the trial social test, I was not among the stressors, but we lead sessions most of the time. <laughs> I think Monica did better at stressing the participants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, like also just know the and creating that environment for stressing people. And I think also something that also stood out was the use of the Called press task at that particular point where we had like to, the cooler boxes and all that setting up, having to go look for ice, ha having to set up, getting the right temperatures, you know. So to me, at that particular point, you no, know, just understanding why do we really have to do this like for the participants, just make that for them to understand, and that's also then being sure that this is not going to harm them in any way. Yeah. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know some would dip their hands in uh, cold water for seconds, then some would assist because there was an incentive for lasting and for the one minute, two minutes. Yeah. So some mm -hmm. would last, yeah, and just asking these questions about now their feelings uh, after the session and all that. So I'm also just happy to be part of the entire stress and economic decision-making study. I think uh, we did the, after the TSST, we also did the cold presser. Then also, I think during, you also brought in the centipede game, I think to me, mm -hmm. it was also another experience that we had, especially like when we were running the sessions, the frustrations, like I can say like, and during those sessions, like the frustrations were so real. Like you could <laughs> see the participants were agitated. <laughs> Tell if you don't know who you are playing against, who is in your group, who is this that is collecting before we can accumulate enough resources. Yeah. So it was just uh, an experience for us just having to get to this, to see this. And also for the hydrocortisone, yeah, you know, it's people getting people to take these pills, yeah, and just seeing how they would uh, respond to it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think the whole, we, I think those, the whole, reassurance how we like reassure them the, the consenting also just having the health professionals on standby in case of anything yep. was more of a surety and uh, just being able that way enable us to implement these studies successfully yeah i, I remember at, at times i felt we were running like a logistics empire or like a nursing clinic uh so for people that don't know the the trier uh, i'm sorry the cold presser task which is a really interesting stress paradigm involves you submerging your hand in, in ice cold water. Um, and so that was that was part of it. So we had to bring in tanks of ice water uh, and then warm control room body temperature water uh, as part of the paradigm. So that was the, that was the scientific paradigm. Now doing that logistically ended up being very challenging. So we had to procure a number of different coolers. I remember uh, we had kind of done some measurements and it turns out when you stick your hand in the ice water, the area around your hand warms up very quickly locally. So then we had to procure a bunch of aquarium pumps to put into the coolers uh, to make sure that the, the, the ice is moving around. The aquarium pumps would occasionally suck in ice. So then we had to create these metal, custom fabricate these metal barriers to separate the ice from the cold water. We had to plug them in under the, under the computers. And if you can imagine the computer cubicles are just bigger than the, the human body because Johannes wanted to put many people in there. So we had to find a way to put the cooler in there, not spill the water. Um, and so, and then between sessions, we also needed hot water for the control because it's quite warm, like a, like a spa temperature water. And so we are simultaneously making, running to the supermarket to grab more bags of ice, dealing with ice suppliers, boiling water in kettles, making sure those temperatures are all right, getting the thermometers to work, getting these aquarium pumps to work. It was, it was an exercise. Sometimes it felt like, uh, a sick game that that there maybe Johannes was trying to stress us out to try to get all this, this stuff done. Um, I, ha I have to believe that there were no aquarium pumps left in Nairobi. After yeah, I think we might there. have bought every aquarium pump in Nairobi at one point because they they, they had a failure rate of about fifty percent after a couple <laughs> sessions. <laughs> so those that was that was really fun and and I, and as Jennifer said, you know, it's some of the interesting things early on. Obviously, you want to make sure that you're doing no harm. So we're doing these we're doing these experiments to ourselves, which which always led to really really funny incidences of of, of submerging your hand in ice cold water. Um, and then when we did the, the hydrocortisone study, yeah, this is taking a hydrocortisone pill. We brought in a number of nurses. We had to do screening questionnaires. There's a number of really interesting 
things. And, and sometimes I would walk down there and it just felt like a, a mobile clinic at, at, at times um, because of the amount of resources that kind of pour into the care uh, given there. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, those days were, those days are really, really interesting trying new things kind of for the first time. Um, Channing, I'm curious about your decision-making process. Like I know you, you know, you were sort of just trying to pass some time in Nairobi. Like what, what brought you to Busara and got you to stick around? Yeah. yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so I, I remember at the time I was a PhD student. I was interested in development, interested in Kenya, and my wife got a job at a microfinance organization there. And I was going there, we we're going there, and I literally just Googled experiments Kenya, and Busara just popped up on the screen. And so I wrote Johannes, and he's like, yeah, it's around. Let's do some stuff. Uh I showed up on the first day uh, in January, right after the office reopened. Um, and I remember at the time, Faison, who was your RA for your your UNIP and your Give Directly paper, was there and kind of trying to run everything because uh, Giovanna had left. And I walked in and it was just madness on the first day because we we're running sessions for the co-ethnic study. No one knew how the recruitment database worked. People were showing up, people had babies with them. And it was, it was just madness and, and chaos. And I thought at the time, this is awesome. I, I love this kind of stuff. You know, I love that we're trying something brand new, that this has never been done before, that we're going to get messy, that we're going to make mistakes. Um, and I think the balance, you know, that you had between running our own research, you know, things that we were really interested in, and then getting the opportunity to see new research that's just on the horizon being created before you know it ends up at a working paper right a year before, maybe two years before it even ends up as a working paper understanding deeply what those those topics are in, in in economics and global development were really really fascinating and so that's kind of what drew me there in the first place and and then you know as the lab as, as you mentioned johannes the lab just grew and you know credit to the previous ceo and someone who's been there a very long time james ansel um he had the ambition to really, you know, take your ideas and and, and run with it and, and really go with it. And I remember very quickly, we turned that from one big lab study into multiple lab studies. I remember then we ran a big field behavioral experiment for Dan Ariely um, and, it, it, and it kind of took off from there. Uh, yeah, and, and so for me, it's, it's been always about exactly that balance between really cutting edge research that we are thinking about and working on and, and solving these problems and then using that as kind of a public good for for other researchers I, I that that mission's always really resonated with me um yeah i'm curious jennifer what what's what's led you to stick around for so long you know you 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 and i are a bit old timers in the busara universe what uh you know what's what's been interesting for you over the years yeah, so I think to me it was more of a, a passion. I think uh, having been introduced to being able to run most of these lab studies. So, uh, like uh, professionally, I'm a trained teacher. So to me, leading those sessions, I sort of like felt I was home. You know, so sort of like being able to lead, um, just being able to read up the protocols, and uh, also over time, you know, you just get to start learning something new and uh, wanting to know more. And I think also having done a bit of uh, economics, so it was more of like, oh. At least the name stuff also attracted me. I'm not like that far off from what I intended to be in life. Yeah. So, and uh, I think over the years, you know, it's just wanting to know and grow and understand more. And uh, you know, I think in the earlier years, to me, it was really happy to tell people what I was doing. Was like, if you talk about, I'm working at a lab. I'm I'm working in a behavioral science field. You know, even for friends, family, it was such a challenge explaining to them what exactly is it that we do. But I. Uh, over time, it has really been something that I can comfortably talk about. And uh, even to people, I feel like the reception, and I also feel like it's, it's people are like really, it's growing, you see, and also just wanting to be part of the journey. Yeah, that's I think mostly what has kept me going for all this long, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I think as, as we, grown you know we went we went from this small i think it was a 24 person it was 24 people because i remember johannes you were very certain that we wanted all the different permutations in case we wanted eight or six or four yeah. right like we, we needed 24 for that um 24 person lab now we have three labs that can run 100 people at once we have mobile labs you know we have other data collection tools and one of the things that i'm really happy about is we also have kind of 
helped other labs, you know, with starting their own lab. Um, that I think is going to enable some really interesting cross-cultural research. And, and I think, Johannes, as you said, you, you know, you've done some of the first cross-cultural research looking at both Switzerland and Kenya. What do you, what do you think it's going to mean for many different countries, not just Busara, to have, to have labs and, and labs that can, can run scientific quality research? Yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited about that happening at some point in the future. I think we're still not quite there, but the idea of being able to deploy the same study in a comparable setting very quickly in many different places has always been super attractive to me. And any move that we make in that direction, I'm very excited about. And ultimately, I think it'd be really nice if you could just, we've, you know, Channing, you and I have talked about this. You could just push a button and it runs in a bunch of different places at the same time. You know, maybe in some in medium term future, even without a lot of supervision uh, from PIs or even staff, but rather sort of on its own, um, just to make that data collection quicker and easier. And um, in, in terms of, I mean, in terms of the substance, I'm actually like mildly skeptical about, about cross-cultural research because there's so many, always so many fixed effects that can mm -hmm. explain any given cross-cultural difference that you see. And so I think often the best use of them is to show universality of sorts mm -hmm. um, or potentially correlations with other stuff that you care about. But um, showing that some behavior like present bias, for example, exists everywhere, that's a really good use, I think, of cross-cultural yeah. studies. And But for that, you really need many countries, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so I'm really hoping there's sort of an uh, an uncanny valley in the middle where you have just, you know, you have more than one country. You, you have just enough countries for it to be really expensive, but not yeah. enough countries for it to be scientifically super interesting. And so I'd love to as quickly as possible get to the point where we don't have like four, five, six countries, but where we mm -hmm. have 40, 50, 60. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think you're, you were starting to see that in things like the psych accelerator. And, you know, I think something similar for, yes. for economics, you know, is, is kind of where, where we'll need to go in order to exactly, as you said, get yes. that universality. Yeah. And I mean, exactly, like there's examples of this and like psych science accelerator is a fantastic one. And then the global preferences survey that Armin Falk and colleagues have been yep. working on. There's really good examples, but sort of institutionalizing that I think is a really important step. Yeah. But to do that, I think as you, as, you know, we need that infrastructure. We need to we need to be able to set up labs in, in many different places and make them very easily and quickly deployable. I think that's yeah. that's one of the the dreams that you know again that we've always had is this idea of a lab in a box, right? How can we make it as simple as possible so that people don't have to go into Busara and measure all the cubicles? We've, we've given them the measurements. Right. They don't need to know exactly which computers to buy. We've we've given them those specs, and I think you know we're making progress in cataloging those learnings. Um, so that people that want to open a lab can kind of see this open source guidebook on things. Because, you know, another thing I'm, I know Jennifer has done and, and Irene has done as well is help to set up these labs in lots of different places. And, and you see, it sounds easy, computers, tables, people, uh, but the, the details matter a ton in, in, in not losing your way as you go. Um, Jennifer, what do you, what do you think, you know, going forward, if, if we, if you want to make that dream a reality to really do cross-cultural research in many different places, what are some of the things that, what are some of the implementation things? What are some of the factors that, that you think really matter to get right? Yeah, yes, I think context is such a very big thing. And uh, as you've already talked about, like how do we work on eliminating some of these barriers? Yeah, so yes, we can try and run these cross-cultural studies, but how do we make them cheap, easier to implement, because I think that has been the biggest challenge for us. So I even remember tr even trying to set up a lab in, uh, let's say, somewhere like Nigeria, Lagos, where we are. Mm -hmm. I sort of like worked with the team. They are trying to set up this, make the systems. So you just realize there are certain barriers that you know, like will stop, will prevent you from being able to achieve your targets in time. So to me, the, the biggest thing, maybe the future will be remote, going remote data mm -hmm. collection, just trying to see how best to eliminate some of these barriers. And again, with the remote data collection, I, I remember earlier on during the pandemic last year, trying to think about how to run some of our studies remotely and just uh, building protocols around this. Yeah, we still managed to face some of some barriers, but I think it was more around inclusion. So for me, inclusion will be the biggest thing. How do we ensure that people are not excluded from our studies. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yes, remote 
is the best way to try and see and maybe how best run most of these studies. But again, how do we ensure that everyone is included? We're not like uh, uh, sort of like biased bias towards a given maybe culture, a given uh, group of group of people, social class and all that. Yeah. So to me, that will be the biggest. And, and, and I really see some progress around that. And I'm hoping in future, we're likely to see maybe get to a situation where we are able to run most of these cross, cross cultural studies. Yeah, I know it's one step at a time, but the beauty is we already on the journey, started the journey mm -hmm. towards it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, during the pandemic, you know, we, we made a, a tool called Kite that helps us collect data remotely, the, the, which is which has been fantastic. We can now collect thousands of observations in a matter of days. Um, but one of the things that it's predicated on is smartphone ownership, right? And we know that there are huge inclusivity issues with smartphone ownership, both across the yeah, economic divide, but then also a gender gap. There's a huge gender gap in, in smartphone ownership. And so we have to be really mindful and thoughtful that we're not excluding the voices of, of many of the participants by by the kind of tools that, that we use. Um, yeah, let's 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 talk a little bit about uh, about maybe the pandemic and and as a segue to kind of the future of lab research, right? Like you know, lab research is heavily predicated on coming in in person, interactive games, interactive experiences with people, um, and and that obviously had to, to pause. Johannes, from your perspective, what did that mean for research, for lab researchers, people who use economic experiments or experiments in, in lab settings? And what do you think, you know, do you think that any of those changes are gonna be permanent? You think there's been a, like, there will be a shift in, in how things go going forward from now on? Yeah, I'm almost tempted to throw that question back to you because I wasn't, I wasn't running a lot of lab work when the mm -hmm. pandemic hit. And so I don't really know it hasn't really affected my own work so much other than like field studies that are sort of classic RCT kind of things, many of which move to phone. And yeah. so there I have a sense that we learned that phone sometimes can work and maybe people are going to be a little more comfortable using it in the future. We also learned what it can't do. And so I don't think in-person surveys are going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. But maybe people are going to get a little more comfortable with phone, perhaps deploy, de develop tools that make it easier. Um, but yeah, I'd actually be curious to hear, like, from from your perspective and Jennifer's, what have you perceived as the difference when you talk to people? Because I haven't done so much lab work recently. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll say one thing, and then yeah, I'd love to hear from Jennifer on this. Um, what was what was interesting is, you know, in those days, in the early days, being forced to do virtual work was actually really fascinating because it allowed it, it made the difference between different areas in Kenya, the same as different areas across the world. So I remember we did a little pilot mm -hmm. uh, with, with students from Swarthmore College and students from the University of Nairobi, where they could actually play games right. kind of interactively with each other that, you know, you probably had, people have, have done before, but like, we'd never really thought that that was possible. And, and then all of a sudden it becomes, it becomes something that you're willing to try, you know, you, yeah. uh, necessity is, is, is the mother of invention, they say. And so do, trying those things are really interesting. Yeah, in addition to maybe the the focus on remote going forward, Jennifer, what do you think it means for the lab? How how did the participants, you know, how did you work with participants through that period? And and what do you think, if any, is going to change going forward? Or do you think that we're going to be able to kind of go back to normal with kind of lab research? Yeah, so I think during that period, I'll maybe try and uh, talk a little bit about two studies that run at that particular point. So one was uh, on messaging campaigns. So I think for that study, it was, it's, I think it was one of the first studies to transition to remote data collection. So building protocols at that particular point, I felt, what is it from the in-person data collection? How do we run our lab? And what are some of the components we're able to pick from there and use in remote data collection? Yeah, so for me, there's something that really felt like, for, for the lab sessions, we normally in, like make calls or send them invitations for them to travel for the lab sessions. So also if you want to participate in, let's say in a remote study, you need to sort of like notify them that you'll, they should be expecting to participate in a study or maybe an experiment at maybe a specific time. So to me, it felt like 
just being able to communicate your like uh, invite it's sort of like an invitation to participate in that study yeah so that study was able to it was the first one it was able to run so well yeah, even though at that particular point you felt that maybe we're excluding people who don't on smartphones, but I remember at that time talking to Nick Nick Osley while I was de developing that protocol. One of our research specialists, and he was like, it, 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 it's, it's a situation that we really can't <laughs> avoid in this scenario. Yes, we are excluding such people who don't own smartphones, who are not able to go through the questions on their own, but to him, he sort of like felt like this is something that really have to, in future, we might find better ways of administering, but under the circumstances, it's something that we can really test and see how well that goes. Yeah. So being able to at least run that, I think we managed to collect it on about 600 participants in days. So to me, mm -hmm. that was just impressive compared to having to invite participants to the lab. I know there's a time for one of our of the record studies were able to bring 150 participants in a day to the lab. But still, mm -hmm. you know, that was just a very special day for us. But uh, I'm seeing us you know, like the, with the remote data question, we were able to do more. And I'm also comparing that now to the other study that you've already talked about, with the one we did the Swarthmore in University of Nairobi students. It was more of an interactive experiment because for us, that is the future. I want to be able to see where we are able to run remote studies interactively because some extent we've been forced to do in-person data collection for remote, for, for interactive experiments. But for that, being able to actually collect data and run a complete study remotely and making it interactive with it. But we were lucky it was with university students because also now that also now select maybe biases what kind of um, data collection platforms or tools we are able to use based on a given sample. Yeah, so to me, it's a future where we don't have to uh, be biased on what kind of uh, platform maybe means to so mm -hmm. using to collect data based on a given sample. Yeah, so to me, that's it's it's a it's a breakthrough, and uh, I'm just hoping that uh, you know with technology everything else is possible. I'm seeing a future where most people are able to on smartphones, most people are able to operate them comfortably, mm -hmm. and we won't be facing some of the challenges that we are currently talking about. Yeah, and maybe that's a good point that threads your two comments together is that you know, the pandemic has kind of forced people to try new things and maybe they'll become a little bit less agnostic. You know, it, historically it's been, you know, I'm a field person, I'm a lab person, I do phone surveys, I do MTurf. And I think you you might start to see, and I hope you'll start to see people being more open to the different modalities of data collection that best fit their research rather than saying, you know, I use this modality and let me think about the best the best research question based on what I know how to do. And so that that's really fascinating. Um, with, with the time left, I, I wanna turn it over because uh, you know, a part of our natural evolution at Busara is going from kind of a very founder focused research agenda paired with helping other PIs realize their research agenda, agenda to then us starting to form our own research agenda. After these seven years, I think we've had some time to reflect and really want to start embarking on things that we find important as Busara to help the broader scientific community. So, you know, I, I want to turn it over to, to Anisha to, to talk a little bit about that in, in the time we have left. Anisha? Jenning, thank you, Johannes, Jennifer. Um, everybody will go through a quick presentation. So Nenga, if you can share your screen for me. Perfect. So as we heard, there are a few things that have come across in the life of Busara. There is how important and how difficult cross-cultural work is and what it means to be universal. Um, there is what it's like to work with participants and low-income populations across the global south. And there's also like all of this influx of new methods, whether they're remote or whether they're in person. Um, there are different types of qualitative and quantitative methods that we're starting to use. How, and I think the main question remains on how can we ensure that the same data quality um, holds across all of the platforms that you want to use. So it can truly be what Channing ended with. Um, it can truly be that you look at your research question and then figure out the modality um, rather than you know tying any researcher, tying themselves to a particular modality. Um, so we founded this CREAM team, which is a unit within Busara asking whether we want what we want, what we think and what we know about behavior who is true for our populations um, and how we can include these populations in our learnings. 
I'm Anisha, the research director at Busara, and I'm going to spend just maybe the rest of 10, 12 minutes um, sharing more about the agendas that we have planned, as well as how all of you can collaborate with us. Um, so just to kick us off, I have a quick video from long-term Busara affiliates and friends, as well as the team who's working on this. Um, Nenga, do you want to go to the next slide and play? It's about a three-minute clip. <laughs> Pusara has already positioned himself as a leader in implementing research in the global south. Their long-lasting presence in the community, as well as their expertise in implementing research projects, will allow them to lead this new agenda in a way that no one else can. I don't think anyone else can better come up with a way of thinking about participant voice, thinking about the ethics and how we think about research and changing those norms that are pervasive, um, thinking about, you know, why is it that results don't hold across multiple settings or what is data quality? How do we make sure that we're actually getting the answers to the questions we're asking? No one else has a reach that will allow them to do this. And so I'm so excited to see what Bazara makes from this. Sarah researchers are the best as they first call you and ask if you're willing to participate and they do not force you. It shows they value us and they don't want to infringe on our rights. I'm excited about this agenda because I believe ethical experimental research can mean something more. I believe that we need to move beyond the narrow focus of uh, the welfare of individual participants only and examine our role within the wider system of international development knowledge especially if our research findings are likely to have an impact on policies and programs. The Busara officers explained it clearly and openly their core area of work and what they stand for as an organization. One thing helped me decide to be part of their studies is the openness and honesty in their operations. Have I received a link to a survey and you completely ignored it? Or you receive a link to a survey that promised you one at the end. So what do you do? You open the link, go to the bottom, hit submit, and you have no idea what that survey was about. I imagine that some of our respondents have Pusara. And that is why I, Winnie, am looking forward to the Pusara methods we should defend them. Because through it, we're going to answer questions such as how can we improve data quality? Like the HPV research informed me and I was able to do away with the myths and misconceptions around the vaccine. So I'm looking forward to better quality data and better methods that bring it about. The most exciting part of the cross-cultural research agenda, for me, is a research question right at the end. It's a sort of culmination, which is what's unique about the Global South? What's different from everywhere else we've studied? And I can't wait to see results on that. When I participate in a research study, I am acting as my community spokesman. So I say things as I see them in my community. Great. So we have this three-year agenda focusing on these three topics. Uh, I'm just going to maybe spend a few minutes giving a little bit of why these have come about and what we're hoping. Um, so the first is process, which is generalizing with equity, um, and we're trying to look at contextualization and cross-cultural validation of a lot of behavioral in the global south. Um, as you heard earlier in the conversation, the agenda is really close to our heart and probably one of the most difficult to accomplish successfully. Um, we were started out with this idea that weird populations contribute to the foundations of behavioral concepts and theories. Um, and we've quite done quite a bit of work to uncover which findings hold across populations and which might not before we can actually apply them to designing and scaling interventions and policies. Um, there are a few things that have stuck with me along the way. Uh, I think one is that it's not just about countries, um, even if we can finally open infrastructure in, or not as ourselves, but even through partnerships, host infrastructure in many countries, um, you still see differences between low income and university students. You see differences depending on different correlates that we might look at. Um, and that's, that's really interesting to understand what 
defines context and cross-cultural um, in the way that it actually affects and influences uh, mechanisms and theories that we know. Um, I think the second one is more on how can we actually build some of these ideas and concepts bottom up. Um, so what does it mean to start with populations this side of the equator and see um, what, what behaviors there might be and what these biases cross preferences look like. Um, and then the third one is how do we get to this stage of having truly generable, generalizable findings and what is universality in this context? Um, so as Johanna said, it's something we grapple with every day. And I think we've come to take a view that truly generalizable findings come about when institutions are present in the long term and can aggregate across many studies. Um, and that works better, of course, when we have institutions have a deep understanding of contexts um, that they seek to serve and generalize from. And that places this agenda really close to our hearts. Um, so what we plan to do is through the next three years, launch an open science investigation of the gaps and understanding um, of canonical patterns of behavior, cognitive processes, preferences, beliefs, and decision-making processes in the global South. Um, comparing our work in multiple contexts and exploring variants across time, place, geography, and so, demography, and so on. Um, at the conclusion of this two years, we're hoping, and I'm going to say it so that we have some sort of commitment mechanism, um, that we can start integrating our findings into the wider theories of global cultural psychology and microeconomic heterogeneity. Um, on the second one, so under research ethics on the next slide, Nenga, um, because we were set up as an experimental lab and you heard all of the story of how we bring people in and how people are just excited to participate even when it's not always um, monetary incentives or any other incentive that drives them um, financially. We often engage with the same community for a lot of our work and this means that we have a deep relationship with them, um, but also it comes with certain responsibilities and we get to hear their perspectives and preferences a lot more frequently. Um, there's a lot of parallel to the Busara world in around the world. There's also a lot of discussion on ethics and randomized trials and the power dynamic of conducting research in developing countries. Um, so as a conduit to communities, we really wanted to answer what it means to run an experimental and non-experimental research ethically. Um, one question that I found myself wondering a lot, and that's prompted some part of this agenda as well, is how do we really define what ethical is and sort of who sets that standard um, and whether being ethical in research is a means to an end or whether it's the end itself. Um, so we set out this agenda that's going to focus on some of the questions on the screen, which is to qualitatively and quantitatively examine what it means to include participants every step of the way, um, co-creating research and interventions. Um, we're gonna combine past learning with new experiments over the next three years to deeply understand the experiences of participants and find ways of closing the loop in communication. Um, from there, we're hoping to co-create, test, and disseminate changes to research processes um, and practices that improve participant welfare and uphold even higher standards of research practice. On the, on the third one, um, and I, this is how the conversation with Johannes, Channing, and Jennifer closed, um, was to focus on how we can have replicable quality across the various emerging channels and modes of research. Uh, in applying behavioral science, we usually get asked two questions. One is that, for example, supposing we're measuring risk and we find counterintuitive findings, um, we often get asked, is it because the data part quality is poor or because the populations actually have a different or uncommon or un, not counter like not intuitive um, risk preference and the second question that we get a lot from the more on the policy maker side is how can we be certain that these findings are actually true uh, we heard something anecdotally which tells us something completely different why should we listen to you um, and i think some part of that is also figuring out that every act of measurement brings with it concerns about data quality and replication um, but very little of the quality assurance work on specific measurement and quality concerns 
in conducting research has actually focused on the global south, but there are a lot of organizations here present doing this work daily and we're hoping to you know sort of bring it all together um, and make it larger than Busara in putting out protocols and understanding and explaining some of how we can contribute to quality. Um, since we operate both remote and in-person, what we're really hoping to focus on in the next three years is um, carefully testing measures and techniques to ensure higher levels of access, response, attention, and comprehension. Um, we plan to also examine what met methodological practices work best for various types of populations, especially those with the least social power, um, and to maintain data quality and disseminate protocols for these methods. That's just a very quick overview um, of the three agendas, but we're hoping you would collaborate with us and reach out to us and we can share more. This is sort of a starting point. Um, we're guided by a scientific advisory panel who has put up on the scheme. Um, there are all long-term Busara affiliates and friends, including Johannes, who's here. Um, and then I guess maybe as we're closing out, just to share how you can collaborate with us. Next slide, Menga. Yeah. Perfect. So what can you, you all do? Um, as a starting point, I think a first order goal for us is to have organizations, researchers, practitioners use our findings. But of course, we're also looking for partners keen to run studies, to write, to jointly write fundraising applications, to join consortiums, to create a community of practice, um, or simply just tell us your stories or what you've heard and what you're interested in, um, and we can build a relationship from there. I just want to end with this idea because Johannes and Channing, they mentioned this evolving logos um, and when we didn't even have a website and somebody was tasked with preparing the first one. Um, it's all, despite all the evolution, um, it's always been our mission to advance and apply behavioral science towards poverty alleviation in the global south. Um, and through this green research agenda, we're hoping to advance the science as well as advance the application of the science in the region. So if you'd like to join us on this journey in any capacity, whatever it might be, whether it's to share your burning questions or stories or ideas, please reach out to me. I've put my email address there or any Busara folk that you know already. Um, we hope you get in touch and I think we can share our journey with you going forward as well. Tenga, do you want to close us out? Sure thing, I can't. So um, thank you so much to Channing and Johannes, Anisha as well, and everyone who took part in the video um, that we showed you guys. We hope this has been informative for you, especially as we're pushing on with our three-year research agenda. We hope that we can collaborate with you and hopefully great things come out of it, even as part of our mission is poverty alleviation within the global South. And yeah, that is it. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. And if you're interested in any of this, please reach out to, to any of us at Busara. We're very, this is similar to everything that we do. We hope that this is a public good for, for all people and all researchers. So whether you're interested in hearing more stories, uh, building a lab yourself or participating in the research agenda in any way, big or small, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And, and speak to you soon.